Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining today's webinar, making us part of your cybersecurity strategy. My name is John Abbey, and I'm a uh, senior product manager here at Infoblox for their security solutions, and I'll be one of the presenters. Today's webinar will be about 60 minutes long, and it will be recorded. A replay of the session will be sent to you after the live event in about 24 hours or so. Also, you are welcome to submit questions throughout the session today uh, through the Q&A box on the left side of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can at the conclusion of the presentation. I also have with me, uh, I also have with me Ben Savage. Uh, ben is a network admi administrator at Morgan County District in Utah and longtime expert and trainer of Infobox Solutions. Ben, you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, like John mentioned, I've uh, worked with Infoblox for about uh, on and off for about 12 years, uh, mainly as a as a trainer for their their different uh, modules, inc including the security class. But also more recently as a as a customer, uh, where I manage a network for uh, the Morgan, Morgan County School District. So I'm happy to be here. Great, thanks, Ben. Ben, uh, he's going to be sharing uh, with us his, his expertise. Um, on our solutions and really on and in the public education vertical and how public school districts or higher education can benefit by securing their their DNS and share insights from uh, from his uh, practical experience. So we're uh, we're glad to have uh, Ben here today. So as we get started, uh, you know DNS plays a critical role in uh, in every network, whether it is is education, you know, public, private, uh, commercial. You know, how it's often looked. Um, leaving uh, an easily accessed backdoor open for criminals, uh, bad actors into uh, into many of our our networks. So today we're going to talk about how you can bring DNS security uh, into the DNS infrastructure that many of you are already uh, have in place in your organization, and get you in that mindset of what you can do with this DNS infrastructure to uh, to detect and and block and and keep your organization secured and, and protected. Um, again, you know, when I talk about organization, again, it, it could be, you know, it could be a public school district, it could be a, uh, it could be a, a higher learning, higher education campus, or, or uh, in the commercial vertical there. Um, and you know, some of this material here is tailored around education, but it can easily be applied across all all, all those uh, verticals that I've uh, that I've mentioned as, as well. So as we talk about uh, Campus networks, uh, you know, recently network professional staff and students at uh, at higher education campuses were invited to uh, participate in an Infoblox sponsored survey focused around uh, the the use of and securing their their campus networks. And the um, the research sought to determine really that the state of the network at learning institutions where IT professionals must manage and uh, protect their their networks. So what we found out was that you know, campus networks are, are under threat, leaving uh, uh, many feeling that it is, it's uncontrollable. You know, in particular, uh, our survey participants mentioned that uh, that securing their campus networks are, is are growing more more difficult. Eighty one percent of our our IT professionals at those institutions mentioned that securing the network is more challenging than uh, than ever. You know, also mentioned you know you have device proliferation, which adds to the uh, network. Uh, uh, demand and, and complexity, putting strain on it. You know, today, today most of our users, you know, they have more than one device, resulting in, you know, more more than one connection. You know, and this trend appears to be accelerating. As nearly nine in nine and ten uh, IT professionals stated that the number of devices, you know, is, is connecting uh, t uh, to the networks and uh, and increasing. So IT professionals, you know, they also stated stated that the uh, you know the vast numbers of devices are you know that they're bringing into the network are um, are already affected and connecting to the network. You know while the, the increased number of devices you know is, is probably enough. You know IT professionals share that many of those devices you know they're they are showing up already with uh, with network uh, or with uh, malware. You know in fact um, more than half of the IT professionals that were surveyed say that 25 percent. Or more, the connected devices are already affected before they they join the uh, the school network for the first time, and uh, that, that could be again, you know, it could be you could relay that to uh, camp campus, 
school districts or, or uh, commercial. Um, you know, so you know, if you put this together in IT and security professionals, you know, this is a, a, a big problem. You know, they, you know, they're, they're going to have to understand. Okay, what's the nature of the malware to even determine if the device, um, you know, is allowed on the network, and then you know, the constant vigilance on those devices while the uh, network on the network to ensure that they're not spreading their uh, their, their malware uh, to other users and, and devices. And was uh, another uh, um, problem stated in the survey was was that uh, um, they mentioned massive user and device uh, turnover or churn every year. You know, 25% or more of the users change each and every year. And, and this makes sense, you know, as, as new students join the school and mainly existing students uh, graduate. So you do have that, that constant churn. And so, you know, when you have these constant flow of new devices to uh, detect, scan, and manage, um, and, you know, just putting that strain on doing that, yeah, a lot of these are are already uh, infected. You know, as we talk about the, uh, the you know, the, the survey also mentioned kind of this, this enemy from uh, with, within, you know, and this is where, you know, some of the greatest risk, security risk comes from. You know, majority of the uh, IT professionals stated that the largest risk is already within the campus and, and likely on the network. You know, a, a concern perhaps, you know, based off of the, the massive number of infected devices. You know, when you, you know, interestingly, when we, you know, ask the same question to the students, faculty and staff, majority of students, you know, they believe that most threats would come from the outside. Uh, the faculty and staff joined in on that perception even more, um, thinking that the threats were, were on the outside. But, uh, but, you know, the IET professionals, you know, interviewing them, you know, they have a very, very uh, different view, uh, knowing that these threats are actually coming from uh, their, their, their students and staff from the, uh, from the, from the inside. Um, so while IT, you know, while they say most attacks come from within the campus, you know, the the, the research that, that we did, you know, also asked students if they were knowledgeable, and this is in particular to higher higher education, if they're knowledgeable about other students reporting malicious acts. And you know, in the survey, 33% uh, of students um, they heard that their fellow students heard of their fellow students hacking school networks or attempting to uh, to place. Um, now we're on it, and so this valid does validate IT IT's perspective that the majority of threats are already within the uh, the, the um, campus. You know, users, you know, they're they're part of the problem. You know, the, basically, you know, only 61% of our participants run any type of malware protection on their devices, and you know, only 60% of the faculty or staff revealed that they've not really adopted any new security precautions over the last. Uh, or the last two years, even with the the constant rise of uh, threats you know, over these uh, over these past uh, two years, um, we found that you know through the survey, you know it's probably not a big surprise that uh, users they lack uh, good good judgment, you know, using questionable um, public networks out there and sharing private information across those networks, and um, you know, lastly, there is this misplaced confidence. You know, a huge majority of participants, you know, 83 percent of them, you know, they they have this trust in the in the network that they're on. But when you talk to, when you interview the the IT professionals, you know, they get the same feeling that this network is uncontrollable. So there's a bit of a of a mismatch there. So, you know, campus IT pros, you know, they're they're uh, besieged by the numerous network challenges. So while the findings in this report uh, expose some issues of managing a campus network, the, uh, our research sought to gather really a comprehensive list of the, some of those top network challenges from our IT professionals. The, uh, the first observation about the data was that there is not one or two big issues, but nearly 10 issues uh, really possessing very similar uh, um, magnitude, um, indicating really broad and uh, this, uh, systemic ch uh, challenge along the way. You know, some of the, the, the sheer concern of the systems is a, is a concern, as knowing by the uh, growing numbers of users and devices, you know, they're the IT team, you know, facing you know security issues from several uh, threat vectors from within. You know, the the affected devices and constant attacks. But um, IT professionals are also dealing with a lot of user issues. You know, we've got poor user judgment, user ignorance, and really the, the and low security to, ta to tackle them. And 
also near the top of the list was uh, was visibility. You know, with a large number of uh, devices, um, you know, being able to recognize those devices, um, many of those devices being um, um, uh, indicated as as unknown. So you know, put it all together, you really the IT. You know, they lack that networking, those networking tools for success. And you know, I, I think probably you know the most surprising finding in research that you know the, is that the tools that the IT and, and networking teams have uh, have to manage and defend their networks. You know, nearly half the campuses lack they felt lacked the comprehensive networking capabilities uh, tools. So. Put it together, you know, you know, summary, the you know, IT professionals, they reveal they have a long list of networking challenges, really centered around three categories, scale, security, and and, and, and the ignorance. Um, then it, uh, I know that, uh, you know, as, as you uh, work with others out, out there, you know, in the school district and, and in education and even the, the training that you've done, several of these findings were brought up in the report. You know, the report mentioned, you know, the increased number of devices, devices brought in already affected, the lack of network tools. Since you live and breathe this each day, I would love to get some of your thoughts and observations on, on uh, what was brought up in the survey here. I think from, from my experience first uh, in working with customers in a training aspect, you, and I think this rolls or um, applies equally to you know school districts, especially secondary, uh, primary school environments, you you have a lot of uh, IT professionals who have to wear a lot of hats. Now, in in a bigger environment like a you know a bigger business or or you know maybe a college type of environment, something with a little bit more resources, they can they have the ability to have you know multiple team members, and those teams can you know, have the ability to, to maybe focus on on one or two areas of, of importance. You, you don't have someone trying to be, you know, the network guru for, for every possible system or, or process, right? But in our uh, – but you, I find that even in those type of environments, and especially in, in, in my school district and in, in school districts that are more rural, you have less less resources, so you have people that are more like like it said in the survey, a little bit more overwhelmed, trying to to manage multiple types of systems and, and processes. And one of the ones that gets left out, it seems like, is is DNS. Uh, I, I you, if if you have someone who has maybe a bind background, or or you know some you know a little bit more extensive uh, history with DNS managing it, uh, I I think that's become more of a rarity in today. That, that I found than uh, more the exception than the rule. I know in, in our school district especially, you know, I manage uh, soon to be six buildings uh, spread across a, a county, so spread across about 10 miles, and we have a total of, of three full-time people, and, and I'm, I'm the only network uh, uh, person, anyone with any type of networking security background. So, so while ours is kind of an extreme, I, I think you see you see a lot of, uh, of of similar examples a little bit as as I work with and as I uh, you know interface with others, especially school districts. I, I think that's your biggest challenge is just having the resources available uh, and people maybe with with the the time or knowledge to to focus on you know specifically DNS sec uh, security. I think is one of the big things that has jumped out. Great. Thank you. I'm going to, as we move on, maybe if you could cover some of these um, your top cyber threats uh, that were um, that were identified in particular for, for yeah. schools. And I believe, you know, I'm sure they apply, whether it's, it's um, K-12, Higher education, or in the commercial sector, you're probably going to find very similar uh, types of threats here. Yeah, so uh, COSIN uh, has, has uh, tried to be a, a leader in helping you know uh, schools be, become more educated from a, uh, specifically from a security standpoint, but just an overall uh, needs of the students and, and, and staff and faculty. And so this is from their some some of their surveys or their um, investigation 
it's all, we, we've probably heard, I think most everyone who does any, any type of experience with, with networking all, you've, you've heard of these terms, you know, how much you've had to deal with it, or maybe even looked at it from a DNS aspect could vary. So, you know, first one they list obviously is phishing. You know, phishing is, you know, we're, 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 we're throwing our line out there as an attacker. I'm just hoping to get something. Can I get, you know, whether it's, it's uh, personal uh, information, can, can, I, can I find some, some little crack in your defense that I can, you know, start to try to sneak in into your network? Uh, some of the types of phishing here they list, you know, you have the deceptive where you're just pretending to be an entity that, that the user may trust. You know, maybe I'm pretending, you know, pretending to be uh, your, your bank or something along those lines. Uh, the spear aspect is, is where I actually have a little bit of personal information about you. So I know I know what your title is. You know I know I know maybe some of your your phone extensions at work, things of that nature. So I can I can uh, even appear more credible as I reach out to you. And you know obviously and this and this contact cannot just be over email. Obviously, we had an example of of this here within our school district within the last couple of weeks, where the bottom one they talk about superintendent fraud. So you know similar to like a CEO, someone is pretending to be that individual. We had an instance where someone has, has gotten uh, an understanding of who, who the person is that runs our, our payroll. And so they started sending emails, and they were able – sending emails imitating some of our, our faculty. And so they were trying to present themselves, hey, I, I need you to change the bank – want to change my bank account for my, you know, deposit each month. And thankfully – our our payroll administrators all at first all she did was send them just a form that they had to fill out well one of the attackers actually filled the form out and sent it back still posing as this this staff and at that point our admin had kind of she'd seen a couple of these and that kind of gave her pause and she did some more investigation and kind of brought us in and, and, and our administration staff in and thankfully nothing sensitive was released Along the same time, someone was sending emails pretending to be our superintendent, uh, asking staff for some information and, and things like that. And, and luckily, and you know, fortunately, the staff they again sent emails to kind of stop that in its track. We, but we then we had even better. We had someone who, who called pretending to be authorized by our, our school board to get information uh, in, in for one of our school credit cards so they could purchase something that they they uh, phrased it as purchasing it for the school district so it, it's kind of interesting just in the last couple of weeks we saw a bunch of different types of phishing going on uh, for us directly and thankfully we were able to to you know cut it off before it got anything sensitive release but that's just kind of one example how you know businesses school districts wherever you are you, we're always under attack uh, I saw a slide a year ago at a security conference and, and the difference between people who've been hacked and, and not been hacked is the ones who've been hacked know they know about it. So that that I mean it's it's something we have to just understand and, and be aware of. Now from a DNS perspective, when we talk about phishing using DNS, um, as users are you know sent links uh, emails, things like that to click on. It seems familiar. It seems like it's my bank. They're asking me to, you know, hey, we've had a fob. We need you to reset your password, you know, provide some information. Well, obviously, the attackers are leveraging DNS to reroute them to a site, to a new domain that appears to be the domain they trust. So, and then, you know, if, if they do that, in, in some cases, obviously, they can get that, maybe get that information in, into your a cache of your your caching service too. So then there's a possibility if other users are trying to go to maybe this a, you know the same banking site, while that lives in their cache, it's going to redirect all those users to the the fraudulent site. So by taking a, a, a you know a, a long held uh, a, a type of attack, you know phishing, by leveraging DNS, our attackers have become a little bit more sophisticated. And using a protocol that obviously all of our users have to leverage to navigate to anything. Cool.
Another thing that Kosen brought up is, is ransomware. We've, we've heard obviously a lot of ransomware over the last several years in the news uh, where we get, you know, code gets installed and locks the, the, the computer or the server or several servers. And, you know, you get the message, uh, you know, you have to reach out to, to the attacker, provide them with some uh, something they want, most, most typically money in, in some type of currency, and then they will give you a code to release, you know, to stop the or unencrypt the data because ransomware is great at it. it encrypts everything, and the only way to open it back up is you need that, you know, the, the code to unencrypt it. So that's a... Uh, that's ransomware. Obviously, that's becoming uh, a, a more and more common, especially over the last several years, uh, type of way to hold hold businesses and school districts hostage. And then, you know, obviously, the data breach, just, just having sensitive information exposed, whether it's going to be used to, we saw it with, uh, you know, a big company like Sony several years ago, where it was used to kind of humiliate them, internal emails, to uh, sensitive data that can then be used to, you know, uh, steal more uh, more uh, information or data from the individuals or business, or just uh, uh, maybe it's, it's sensitive data that you know that you know proprietary data, and now you know the the, the attackers are then can leverage that to sell it to the competitors to use. One uh, an example from a DNS perspective with this type of uh, attack is is what we call command and control. So uh, getting uh, the user again is is is, is somehow getting uh, a piece of software malware, if you will, installed on their machine, and then that software in the background is going to run, look for any information that the attacker might find useful, and then it using DNS it it breaks that information into chunks and sends it using just DNS queries through your firewall back to the command and control server. So from a, a standard firewall, something that, that is great at blocking other types of services and attacks, all it's going to see is DNS questions or queries come through it. So naturally, we allow queries to go through our firewall. That, that is important for DNS to work. But all these queries are, when you look at them, they're, they're, they're essentially bad questions. So the command and control server will just respond with the simply, you know, name does not exist, most typically. But inside that packet, in the payload of each of those queries, is a piece or chunk of, of the data that's being stolen, and it's encrypted. And so a firewall just you know, typically does a DNS inspection will see that the query looks like a standard DNS query. But without understanding more of, uh, uh, of the DNS specifics from a, a, a more of a deep protocol type of inspection, it would it would miss the fact that each one of these queries is sending a chunk of data back to a, a command and control server that then reassembles all the data back together on that side is able to decrypt it and now they have the data from our infected computer and what makes these even more fun to deal with is typically these are then designed to kind of search your network to get themselves installed on other other devices in the network so they can repeat the process This, this slide is, is giving a little bit more information here on, on that type of exfiltration. exfiltration. Uh, and it calls out that from an, an Infoblox perspective, one of the things we, we can leverage, uh, we call this uh, threat insight, that we can help leverage to detect or do more of a deep inspection on those type of packets and, as, and looking for anomalies. Because there's always a, a fingerprint, if you will, with these type of attacks. So if you have something that has a more uh, understanding of DNS and a deeper understanding of, of how DNS should look, what, what are things that even though they're leveraging DNS, they, they appear to be anomalies or uh, they're not normal. Uh, it then has the ability to help uh, lock down, stop that um, communication from proceeding. and where you would lose all the data you probably, you know, after the first, you know, 20, 30 bytes of the data, we're able to lock it down and stop it from, from going out through, uh, from our internal network. Last part here, uh, from a COSIN standpoint, we talk about uh, DDoS. Um, 
DDoS attacks, typically DDoS, uh, those type of attacks, those denial of service attacks are, are just trying to overwhelm your services, your, uh, your DNS servers to keep them from responding, to keep them from, uh, uh, to lock them up, if you will, so they can't respond to valid qu- uh, requests and essentially shut down your, your, your DNS presence uh, from an external standpoint. Uh, the attackers here aren't necessarily looking to steal anything per se. Typically, they're just looking to disrupt your service, uh, to you know prove a point or to to be a nuisance. Uh, now, uh, DDoS could also be used as a uh, as a distraction as well. Uh, I think they they found some instances where the DDoS attack, again, while taking down the the, the name servers or, or essentially overwhelming them. Uh, it provided cover or a distraction from then the the real attack that the hackers wanted to leverage uh, to then you know whether then at that point while everyone's focused on trying to stop the DDoS part the attackers kind of trying to sleep uh, slip through the back door if you will so uh, again these are becoming more more sophisticated more uh, targeted a, a very common uh, attack by by uh, our you know uh, attackers who have, you know, whether they have a, a different uh, philosophical agenda than that company, you know, whether they're, they're the the attackers that just like to, you know, be more cause more chaos, things like that, or or even more sophisticated, where they're using it as a as a, a again a distraction for their real attack. Uh, these are again really important that we have uh, systems in place that can help. Uh, help mitigate, help uh, limit uh, the damage when you face an attack like this. Some some common practices for these might be uh, using what, what we call uh, Anycast to help your DNS, external DNS or internal DNS presence be, be spread across multiple servers uh, using routing, uh, dynamic routing tools there that, that help when, when an attack like this occurs, it, it helps mitigate it, that it, it's less effective because it can't compensate for the fact that we can reroute the queries to other name servers who have who are ready to respond. So some things like that, uh, some other tools, uh, Infobox has another tool called Advanced DNS Protection that can also help uh, with limiting and, and mitigating these type of attacks as well. But ultimately, like was mentioned earlier, uh, in, in, our, in our environments today, uh, especially from an educational standpoint, we are trying to get our students and faculty the ability to use what's out, you know, the services that are out on the internet. Uh, we're trying to get them exposed to, you know, to all, all the wonderful things that are out there that can help their learning and, and help them be more more effective in, in the classroom environment. And once they leave the classroom, but just the very nature by by inviting those things in, obviously we're we're opening possible. Uh, holes in our defense that attackers can leverage. So the more we are aware of, of how those things could expose us, the better off we'll be uh, um, when a time comes that someone tries to attack us, we'll be prepared and, and ready to to adjust and, 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 and come combat it. Thanks, Ben. Um, you know, as we talk about the security landscape, you know, as we saw from our survey, uh, Mentioned earlier, you know, organizations you know they, they lack this comprehensive you know these comprehensive network uh, management solutions and uh, with all the choices of vendors out there you know the thought of, of securing an organization network you know it, it can be daunting and uh, and a bit overwhelming. You know the you know the increasing you know threats of phishing and ransomware and data breaches that Ben just mentioned and you know put that on top of a security security ecosystem you know that's it has expanded to more of a a vendor-oriented uh, oriented approach to uh, to network security you know, has led to optimization challenges affecting the the efficiency, particularly when it uh, comes to being able to st- uh, the streamline and, and understand the, the context and prioritization of 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 threats and alerts you know that are seen within your your, your infrastructure. Uh, being able to know you know what to do with them. You know, how, how how to prioritize? Is it, is this something that I need to take on immediately? So you know, as as you see all these different uh, security uh, you know applications out there, you know, more security doesn't necessarily mean uh, uh, 
uh, better security. You know, and in fact, I think the, the current strategy of learning on you know many of these different technologies, you know, it's not only uh, proving to be uh, to be ineffective, but it's also becoming really overly complex and expensive. As you know, Ben mentioned a little bit earlier about you know kind of being a, a one man band, you know, managing you know six different uh, buildings, and especially out in the rural areas, you know, you know having having enough uh, resources on hand to, to be able to uh, to, to manage these uh, uh, different uh, layers of, of, of security here. Um, so, you know, so, you know, even as organizations, you know, they spend more money on security, you know, the irony of it is that, you know, losses to, to cyber to cyber crime is, you know, doubled in the, uh, in the last few years. So, you know, as IT professionals, they, they look to address their security concerns. You know, the most common approach is this defense in depth strategy where you're just kind of piling on, adding more layers on top of more layers of products, really to build, um, to uh, build bigger walls uh, in, in your network security. And you know, with over a thousand recognized uh, uh, vendors, leaders in the security solution business, it's easy to, for organizations to become a bit overwhelmed as they look to make sure that uh, they have the right technology pieces in, uh, in, in place there. You know, as, as, as organizations, you know, you know, they load up on their, their, their firewalls and intrusion uh, protection systems and detection systems and antivirus and, and DLPs, you know, I think that the challenge with traditional security systems is that they, they have limited visibility into, um, into DNS and don't focus on uh, DNS-related threats that we'll cover here in, in a minute. Um, we, you know, why we want to secure those. But, uh, you know, there's typically, you know, there's three protocols that are allowed to exit through the firewall. We have mail, web, and, and DNS. And, yeah, there are email solutions out there to help filter, you know, email and attachments. You know, solutions like Symantec and Maxi, they do, you know, a very good job. And, you know, you can train staff to detect or report on suspicious emails. You know, you can make sure that you have a well-advertised process in place for reporting suspicious emails or, you know, your firewalls and email systems, you know, they could be configured to have these rules that don't allow uh, bad attachments. But, you know, that one time when a, a staff member or a student, you know, they click on that malicious link, you know, perhaps from their home network, you're not always going to be able to catch or quarantine these uh, malicious, uh, this, uh, malicious software, you know, before it spreads. You know, you have your web, web, web filter solutions like uh, Blue Cat and WebSense, and, you know, they do a very good job. Yeah. Um, DLPs, data loss prevention systems, to you know detect potential data breaches by monitoring and detecting and blocking sensitive data transmission. But again, you know it usually checks the protocol used by email, or web browsers, and peer to peer. Um, but often, you know, they, it does neglect um, DNS. Um, so you know, then you have you know, like I said, you know, you have the DNS, which is is often overlooked by by system administrators, you know, many firewalls, you know, they white whitelist DNS by default. You know, this creates that that utopia for for bad actors who can then use DNS to carry out attacks such as malware, that data exfiltration phishing that uh, that uh, then went over um, a little bit ago. So why do we need to uh, secure DNS? Well, 91% of malware uses DNS to, to maintain command and control that Ben mentioned earlier, to, to exfiltrate uh, data, to redirect traffic in order to carry out campaigns. And it, it does so because DNS is meant to, to be open and, and, and work all the time. Now, this is why DNS-based malicious attacks, you know, are, are the, is the number one threat vector. You know, bad actors, they, they, they have an easy way in because of the openness of, of DNS. And the lack of DNS controls in place by most organizations and bad actors, they have a they have an easy way out again because again of this openness of, of DNS and lack of uh, DNS controls like you know inspection of the outgoing traffic. Um, you know, SD Magazine, you know, they had a, a survey out there and they found out you know nearly half of respondents said that their organization you know experienced some type of DNS exfiltration or leaking out of data via via D DNS. You know, that's that's half that re that responded and said that, that they've seen this. You know, this doesn't even take into account those that aren't aren't even aware that it's happening. You know, as as you find, you know, a lot of people aren't. Um, 
So, you know, why are why are the bad guys? Why is DNS such a uh, why are they using DNS and why is it such a, a great target? Well, there's several factors that make DNS especially attractive. You know, it's, it's due to its you know ubiquitous, you know, always on but behind the scenes nature. You know, DNS is often you know is overlooked, like I mentioned. You know, by system administrators. You know, it has some inherent vulnerabilities coming just from the design to be open and easy, um, easy operate system. You know, you know, DNS is you know it's the cornerstone of the internet. It's used by by every business and government. It's part of the fabric. You know, of both the internet and the public corporate networks use, and you know, it works so efficiently that you might even just forget forget it's there. You know, until it's, it's used against you. You know, it's, you know, DNS. You know, it's easy, fairly easy to exploit. Like I mentioned, you know, bad actors they they love that openness. They love that easy way in to propagate malware, and they love that. Easy way out to exfiltrate out uh, exfiltrate out uh, sensitive data, you know. And like I mentioned, you know, traditional perimeter protection was, you know, often you know, ineffective um, uh, against you know, these evolving uh, threats. So, you know, even the most security savvy organizations, you know, they have they have gaps in their security. You know, and, you know, we, we, you know, one such gap is often DNS that we that we call the, the data point spot. Um, you know. You know, organizations, you know, from that uh, security landscape, you know, they're piled on with firewalls and antivirus and data loss preventions um, and, F and and others, you know, network uh, protocol traffic. But, you know, I think, with, again, you know, they don't, a lot of organizations don't realize that these traditional security measures, you know, they don't protect enough against DNS attacks. You know, the, you know the, you're, you're leaving port 53 um, in the firewall um, open. And you know, port 53. Yeah, you want it. It's left open to ensure that good flow of traffic and let legitimate queries out, so that services and applications and and your students and staff and workforce can get to the resources that they need. Um, so really, in, in essence, what you're doing is that you know, by building up your perimeter uh, security the, the way many organizations are, you know, you're you're building up the state of the art front door, but you're also at the same time by neglecting. DNS, you're leaving that back window open for uh, for the bad actors, and you know these bad guys, they they know this, and you know they're going to bypass your front door security deployments by by uh, transporting that sensitive data from the inside out to that uh, that uh, back window, likely without any type of inspection or detection that's uh, that's happening. You know, we we did a survey a little while back, and um, yeah, we found out that two thirds of the DNS traffic logs that we've looked at showed some signs of, of malicious uh, uh, activity associated uh, with it. So, you know, what, what can you do? Um, you know, the, the, that very weakness of, of DNS can also be turned into a strength with the right solutions in place. You know, because DNS is always on, and it's, a, it's also a, a great place to plug in the defense layer that off. Offers you know that, that protection from threats that tr uh, that traditional security solutions um, would, uh, would would miss. You know the, the architectural positioning of DNS means that you know it is at the ideal vantage point to see attacks coming and the perfect control point to 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 defend your uh, environment. You know you know if we take a look at the you know take a closer look at the defensive opportunities provided by DNS. You know and we're going to take a look at. That, that critical role that DNS plays in protecting organizations you know, against these phishing and ransomware attacks and, and data breaches via data exfiltration. Um, so, you know, let's talk more about where uh, DNS fits into the cyber cyber uh, strategy security, um, and it's in really in more places that you uh, that that you might uh, that you might think. You know, one way to make DNS part of your uh, cybersecurity strategy is to leverage, you know, threat intelligence to protect your DNS traffic using uh, response policy policy zones. You know, and it's putting these RPZs to use. You know, as the name suggests, you know, RPZs they're, they're zones. You know, they're that, you know, they're, they're are they're, um, are zones that are kind of a administrative container in DNS. You know, normally these zones contain resource records that map domain names uh, to IP addresses and uh, to mail servers and the like, but with RPGs, the zones contains um, uh, records that can also be interpreted as, as rules. You know, these rules can say things like if someone looks up, you know, the address of this domain name, you know, send this address, um, you know, instead of the one that they're looking for, um, that you get from resolving the name on, on the internet. You know, someone looks 
wants to look up a domain name, you know, tell them it doesn't exist. So that, that first rule I mentioned is, is really useful for, you know, redirecting users who are trying to reach a malicious destination, you know, to a web server that displays a, a warning page or redirecting devices that are infected with, you know, with malware, you know, to be to a, a, a honeypot where the, uh, the malware's activity can be scrutinized, you know, you know, this, you know, by, by having these RPGs in place, you know, it, it's useful for a couple of reasons. You know, it helps you identify the infected devices. If your device, if your DNS server receives a query for a domain name in a response policy zone, now that's an indication of a compromise. You know, after, you know, after all, you know, if the computer sends you a query for a domain name that's well known to be the name of a command and control server for a particular bot, well, you know, it's a good bet that that uh, that computer is, is going to be uh, is infected. It also helps mitigate the infection. You know, most malware, you know, there, it won't do much damage, you know, if you can't communicate with the command and control server. And, and then, you know, talked a bit about uh, the, the workflow, or not the workflow, but the, the malware flow of, uh, of uh, malware C2. You know, it's not going to be able to exfiltrate the files, you know, if it can't resolve the name of the server to draw them on. You know, ransomware likely won't encrypt the files if it can't transmit the, the, the cryptographic key that is generated uh, to the ransomers. You know, it's more, you know, DNS, you know, it uh, provides a built-in mechanism for, you know, publishing and subscribing to, to these sets of rules that I talked about. Um, you know, uh, companies like, you know, like, like Infobox, you know, they publish these up to, up to the minute list of malicious domain names and RPGs, you know, on these uh, internet accessible DNS servers and, you know, administrators, you know, who want to subscribe to those can configure their DNS servers as secondaries for those RPGs. And so as the, as the data and RPGs change, the, you know, the publishers, you know, you know, like in the box, you know, you can notify subscribers and, and the subscribers can just, you know, transfer and make those changes to the, uh, to the zone. Um, you know, and, and the DNS firewall, you know, it's also going to be, you know, you can also report on the malicious activity, you know, with, with reporting, you can find out which endpoint actually try to make the malicious communication, um, you know, what IP address, you know, the device MAC address and what, what type of uh, what, what type of device it is. Um, we talked about, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry to sorry to interrupt there. One one thing we've done on at our school district with those RPGs is uh, with our students. You know, they're they're really good at trying to get around some filters. Like uh, for example, like you know, you want to enforce like Google Safe Search, or like more of a, a safe. You know, like for any YouTube video they want to access. We, we've used a RPZ to create our own little redirect policy to where rather than, you know, trying to rely on, on um, the browser itself and, and, you know, the settings in the browser, which a user can a lot of times hack and, and change back, we just did it at a DNS level. So now any search they, they try to do for Google and Bing automatically in our RPZ takes them to the safe search server for both of those those applications. So there's it prevents any students from, from hacking that and, and changing the outcome because it's it's at the DNS level and not in the you know the, the browser itself, uh, a setting that they might be able to, you know, change on their own. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Like I I have, you know, two children myself in, in high school and you know they're always talking about you know how to get around, you know, being able to get to sites. So that are are blocked by the by the school district, you know, whether it's it's you know, what what you're talking about or or VPN. So yeah, I mean, where well, there's a will, there's a way. And you know, with these kids are to try to get around any you know security uh, uh, policies put in place, and it's definitely a bit of a, a cat and mouse game with with <laughs> with, with these students. The uh, you know we. Next, uh, you know, leverage DNS security is, is using, um, you know, a behavior analytics to uh, detect and block DNS-based uh, data exfiltration. And, and man, you, I know that you've mentioned uh, this here in uh, in previous slides, where you know you're you're, you're taking a look at uh, at DNS activity and you know putting some. Uh, uh, Intelligence, you know, look, looking at it, and uh, you know, is, is taking a look at some of the features of that of that uh, domain. You know, is, is 
you know, when you have this algorithm, you know, it's looking at the entropy, you know, the, of the uh, domain, subdomain, and, you know, does that domain contain a lot of information? What's the frequency? What's the size? So it's looking at, you know, some of the lexical fe uh, features, you know, does it appear to be encoded, encrypted? You know, does it, uh, does, is it a domain that, you know, yeah, can be found, you know, the, the language of the domain can be found in, in various languages of the dictionary, you know, and you're able to identify some of these abnormal uh, queries, and we're able to, you know, find this actually quite effective, uh, effective you know, after we've tested it with, with uh, billions of, of, of DNS data, and, and so these, you know, you're identifying these, these abnormal looking domains being used to exfiltrate out data, blocking it, and to prevent really that data um, exfiltration going uh, um, uh, uh, in the future, you know, future attempts as, as well. And, you know, another thing that you can do is, uh, is really get, get your team talking about, um, about the, uh, DNS and DNS security. You know, playing with, you know, defense, you know, with DNS, you know, really begins with the awareness and understand and understanding, you know, you need to understand what the bad guys are doing, bad actors are doing, and how they're using DNS and how do you safeguard against them, you know, and, you know, depending on how your, you know, security departments, you know, how you're configuring the DNS environment, you know, maybe the responsibility of a, you know, of a, of someone you know, on the network side, or maybe yeah, maybe it's on the security team. But no matter what, you have to uh, raise that awareness of DNS and DNS security vulnerabilities in your in your organization. You know, who in your organization is responsible for DNS? You know, do you have a team? Do you have a person charter looking specifically at DNS? So you know, who's looking at the traffic going through port port 53? Um, again, you know, who's uh, who's responsible for that? Next slide, I'll I'll, uh, I'll hand off to Ben again. Um, you know, taking a look at you know, what, uh, what what schools can do, which again can be easily applied to uh, to uh, to organizations as well in the commercial sector. Yeah, I think the biggest uh, the biggest thing I found uh, again, our school district and, and the you know the the ones that we work closely with in our region. And, and those I've, I've had the you know, opportunity to work with from a training aspect is first and foremost um, getting getting a good foundation of, of DNS itself. Once once you have a, a, that foundation in place, you're you're then able to start to better understand or better uh, identify how how you need to protect uh, your environment. Uh, one of the things like in, in our Again, over the last couple of years in my school district, I uh, we ran an, an, another type of uh, a DNS solution when I first started working with them about five years ago. So about four years ago, I was able to get our, uh, an Infoblox uh, to to man, you know, to take over and manage both, you know, DNS and DHCP, but primarily DNS. And then over the last several years, I've been working, like I mentioned earlier, uh, on ways to try to attack. Or approach our security from a DNS standpoint. So I mentioned, you know, one of those, you know, with the safe search, uh, getting get, taking things out of the hands of, you know, of, of users, of you know, removing their ability to to mess or meddle with settings. Uh, I find is, uh, from my point of view, is, is one way that I sleep better at night, being you know the, the network admin. So uh, if I can leverage DNS, that's that's typically uh, one of the best ways to to remove, you know, the the settings or, or the little the little configurations that users might find a way to manipulate. Uh, another thing we we encounter a lot, especially in the secondary schools, is is this concept of, of filters. Uh, here in the state of Utah, we you know we have a by law you have to have a filter in place. So you know you're filtering again. You, leveraging DNS, but but filtering on keywords and and, and things of that nature. Uh, a lot of the filter products, I, I the one we were using, I won't mention its name because it, it really was a piece of junk. Um, they didn't do a good job. More often than not, they were blocking the sites that we wanted the students and staff to access. So one of the great features I've had over the last year in place with uh, 
with InfoBlox's active trust is along with those response policy zones, uh, the, the active trust cloud also provides a, a filter of its own on keywords and, and, and subjects and, and things of that nature. So just implementing that, having, having a more, um, how do I want to put it, a, a filter that, that understood DNS better has helped has helped me a lot. A lot of our false positives have, have dropped off and not been an issue anymore. Because that, that, that's another, I think, another challenge with security in general. How much cycles do we spend trying to resolve the issues that should not be issues, those false positives? versus attending to the true issues, you know, uh, patching up the holes in our defense, you know, doing our border patrol, if you will, around the walls of our network, making sure, you know, nothing is trying to, you know, to attack or successfully penetrate the defenses we've set up. So have, having uh, those type of uh, solutions in place have helped me, again, being kind of the one-man band from a network standpoint, be able to spend more time focusing on on the things that really matter will improve my environment versus always kind of chasing my tail, if you will. That's been uh, that's been the two biggest. I, I think the last under this last bullet there, from a people standpoint, goes back to just helping that DNS awareness. Uh, our state agency that we work with, they have they have uh, Infobox name servers in place that we use as our forwarders. And so I found early on that they, they you know, had some of the basic understanding of, of the settings and concepts, even from just a DNS standpoint, but there was a lot of gaps that, you know, needed to be filled in. So as I've been able to work with them and fill in those gaps, we've become much more effective and efficient overall, just, just from, a, from a DNS uh, resolution standpoint, uh, again, things that may have been broken because DNS wasn't set up right in the first place or properly, you know, properly configured. Those have disappeared, and that's made our end user experience much better. Sorry. Um, the incident detection response, um, as I've mentioned is I've been able to focus then on, on the things that, that truly matter. Uh, now I can direct my time and energy on, on the real issues that might pop up in my network, um, being able to work with my, my director and, and other board members on focusing on those things that can truly help us uh, moving forward, whether it's, you know, purchasing new type of solutions and gear. And, and then, you know, again, the, uh, using DNS to help identify my assets and parts of my network has helped me be much more efficient as well. Great. Um, thanks, Ben. So as, as we wrap this up, and um, I'll also answer a couple of questions here, but uh, Really, you know, the call to action here again is, you know, make make DNS your 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 first line of uh, defense here. You know, like I mentioned, you know, even the most security, you know, the savvy security companies, uh, you know, uh, you know, they are security savvy companies. You know, they have gaps in their security. You know, and one you know that one such gap is DNS. You know, so you know, just don't focus on your perimeter security. You know, you know, your your next gen firewalls or your email gateways or DLPs, you know, they, they don't really address that DNS blind spot that we talked about earlier. You, know, you need to start thinking about your, um, about that, that infrastructure uh, protection there. And so you can make, you know, DNS your first line of defense by, you know, by, you know, raising the awareness of DNS um, and DNS security within your, your organization. Again, you know, who's, who's responsible for DNS security and, and are they looking at the traffic? Are they, uh, you know, are they looking for um, an, um, anomalies in that uh, in that traffic? Um, another way you could uh, uh, make DNS your first line of defense is, is by leveraging threat intelligence to you know protect your your DNS traffic and and, and block that malware to uh, communication, uh, block that malware communication to C2 sites. You know, this is, you know blocking by uh, domains and IPs on the, the, the blacklist. You know, you can also you know. Choose to 
you know, with the threat intelligence, you may uh, block by uh, by the age of the domain. You know, you know, any domains that are you know created in you know last you know let's say you know 24 hours or three days, what have you, you can choose to uh, to, to block those. We know that many of these new domains that registered are you know often not uh, uh, used for legitimate uh, business uh, purposes. So looking at uh, you know, looking at security, you know, analysis on your on your, your DNS traffic. You know, you're looking at your query logs to you know, identify again these anomalies or irregular um, patterns. You know, uh, you know, you're looking at you know what does a normal baseline look like versus what is a you know you know what is a, a, a spike in activity um, look like. You know, what parts of the world you know is your are you, are you sending uh, uh, traffic to? It? You know, if you're you know, in Utah, should you have a command and control? Should, uh, should you have a, a computer reaching out to a command and control site out in the or an IP? Let's call that out in the you know eastern eastern Europe. Um, so again, you know, take, taking a look at this, um, and again looking at the host name structure, you know, the length, the entropy, the size, the frequency that uh, the tra of the uh, of the traffic. As you know, it could be data exfiltration attempts. So you know, another way is is knowing the exact machines, you know, making these requests to malicious domains. And we talked about that. We talked about these response policy zones. Knowing the, you know, knowing which domains are, are malicious, but then understanding which uh, machines are, are reaching out those, to those uh, malicious sites. Um, and then being able to track those machines down and, and remediate the affections uh, to the source of the, of the computers. And then, you know, finally, um, you can uh, talk to uh, talk to Infobox, and you know we can help. You know we can um, we have solutions to stop uh, these uh, reach outs to uh, malicious sites and uh, DNS based data exfiltration. Um, you know you know we we also you know have you know we can also take a look at your organization's DNS setup and really kind of assess the level of risk you know and exposure to the uh, to the uh, DNS threats. Um, so with that said, you know there are a um, a couple you know there there's um, some some questions here. Um, then you probably answer or help answer this one is you know what kind of you know maybe what kind of are the levels of of RPG blocks you know do you see at at your school district? Yeah, I just I sent that in the text, but just uh, from a vocal. I think I think the more what RPZ has helped me the most where filters were failing me is, is you have like a kind of time wasters or things, you know, sites students use as distractions. So a lot of these online little free gaming sites are one example. Um, when trying to block that as a category in a state in a classic filter, it would block sites that a lot of our educators, educators use for legitimate purposes in the classroom that are also considered, you know, gaming sites. So the RPZ features really helped me, you know, specifically block the sites my administration has asked that, that we, you know, block student access to while still being able to allow the educators access to the legitimate uh, gaming ones. Where So where traditionally a filter would just block all or nothing, RPZ has allowed me to be a much more, um, much more specific and granular. So, that, so that's been a, one of the bigger ones. Right. So, as, as you're monitoring your, your DNS traffic, you know what is a um, like? Is there such thing as a normal day? Like, you know, what is a? You know, we talked about you know looking for abnormal abnormalities in your DNS traffic and but being able to establish a baseline. Are you, you know, what what does a normal day look like for you? Is there a normal day? You know, how do you how do you uh, you know what is that red flag? Uh, appear for you when, when looking at DNS logs? Uh, I think a normal day would be Tuesdays when no one's here, if I could say that. That, that's, that would be my normal day. Um, no, uh, seriously, um, an, an, you know, a normal day, you, you start, for us, it's, it's getting a baseline, you know, based on the number of, like, queries uh, that go through my server. So it, it's taken time you know, to kind of gather that and just see, okay, this is a, a standard amount of queries. And so then one way to approach it is, okay, do I see spikes in the amount of queries per second? Uh, much, you know, the amount of data that's flowing through 
is, is that changed um, from a security standpoint looking for um, you know I, I think you're always going to see hits especially if you're leveraging the RPZ feeds you'll see hits uh, because as, as people hit sites and then there's pop-up windows and you know those other things that kind of try to tag along on some legitimate sites you're going to see some hits there that aren't you know necessarily you're being attacked or you've been exposed but maybe look again looking at uh, do you see more uh, am I seeing you know am I seeing the same name a lot of times that could be an indication that I have a lot of clients trying to hit the same you know this same uh, site that's being blocked. Okay, why is that? I need to probably do some more investigation. Why do I have so many clients trying to go to this particular site all of a sudden? Uh, so, so some things like that. That's that's how I. Um, obviously, there's not a number you can throw out there because every environment's different. But that, those are the kind of things I look for. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, there's yeah, I I guess you know the short or the long is yeah there is no such thing as a normal day, you know each each day yeah. brings each day different yeah. Well, we're getting to the uh, yeah. to the top of the hour here. Um, just I want to get this uh, um, wrap wrapped up here. Um, so I want to uh, thank everyone for spending time with uh, with us here um, at Infobox and and uh, we want, I want to thank uh, Ben as well. For, for joining us um, on the uh, webinar here um, at 11 o'clock here, so it's actually shortly after 11 right now. So there is a, a webinar that InfoWatch is putting on on the new uh, government directive on the DNS audit, and so you know, please join us if, if you can. And what I'll do is I will pass on the uh, pass on the link here um, in the Q and A so that uh, you guys uh, that everyone uh, has it. So. Again, as we wrap this up, I want to thank everyone and uh, and have a good uh, rest of the day. Thank you.